Welcome everybody to um, a very interesting topic today. We are um, discussing how to deal with anxiety, how to cope using Enrich method. My name is Daria Haitoglu. I'm a psychologist and a director of Virginia Satir Institute in the UK, London. Originally, I'm from Siberia, from Russia, and um, both uh, sides of my family, father's family, are from Ukraine. Uh, married to a Greek, and uh, we're both British as well by passport. And our two of our children were born in Switzerland, and we just moved to Greece, where our little baby girl Athena was born seven months ago. So. As you can imagine, living in a multicultural family uh, with different uh, facets and working in different countries, I think uh, collectively with my husband, Alex, we worked and um, traveled in more than um, 16 countries where we actually did projects and worked together. So uh, my previous career was in a multinational company across uh, business, marketing, and HR. I was head of uh, recruitment for um, the European office. And uh, I dealt with a lot of anxiety personally, as I call it, uh, I'm part of the um, insecure overachiever kind of uh, syndrome, people who have high expectations for themselves and others, but also worked with many people across my career, both in the corporate world and also in the psychological world since I requalified and opened my private practice, became a director of the Virginia Satir Institute. And also we offer uh, workshops, retreats around the world where we gather people from all walks of life and we do deep dives for people who would like to feel better um, if they suffer from any mental health issues or they just want to enrich their relationships or maybe find their passion or happiness in their life or mingle with other people from around the world. We host retreats in Greece, in England. We um, have workshops all around the globe. So, yeah. A lot of um, material to cover today, and also I'd love to share some personal and professional stories um, with you as we go through this. And I chose a few slides that depict and highlight in illustrations and visuals. So hopefully you can see the slides as well as here, because there are people with different preferences to learning. Some people are uh, really good at hearing and listening and understanding through words and sounds. Some people are visual folks. They like to see in order to learn. And some people are kinesthetic. They like to actually touch and experience things. So I'm one of the latter. I'm a kinesthetic person. And if you're one of those, I suggest you, uh, first of all, if you're using gadgets, and they are great distractors and they are great anxiety triggers. So I invite you to put them sort of face down and uh, watch this presentation on a laptop, but without messages or without you know, multitasking. Because actually when we multitask, instead of doing things in parallel, we constantly switch between these little tasks and in that way, we overwhelm ourselves and create a form of stress. So in order for us to feel better and learn how to deal with anxiety, one of the first tools that I teach and share with my clients is how to be monotask, concentrate on one thing at a time and enjoy it. So I invite you to grab a glass of water or a cup of um, tea, relax in your chair. Um, and hopefully you can watch the slides as well as listen to my voice. And maybe, maybe hold something nice in your hands. So I have different things that are kinesthetic. For example, they're nice fabric. 
or um, their nice, nice texture or the things that I really can fidget with, you know, and use my fingers to have that experience and create senses and occupy my kinesthetic um, intelligence so that it can actually help me learn. So different things for different people. And the first slide, as you can see, I chose uh, from a wonderful artist, Sergey Block, Serge uh, Block, who writes for uh, Draws for Time. It's actually a piece of art, as you can see with a red thread. Um, a person on the left, sort of standing there and the thread is around him. And how we can use this thread, not just being uh, sort of um, restricted by it, but how can we use this red thread to ride a bicycle of life and learn to be adaptable, flexible, and what Charles Darwin used to call, you know, the, the survival of the fittest, who are the most flexible and able to cope with life challenges people. So welcome to how to deal with anxiety presentation. And anxiety is a normal these days if you see what's happening in the world if you open any media any news it's full of uh, triggers so it's today like um the most probably important topic if you google anxiety there are millions of clicks and one of the most prevalent uh, syndromes and disorders disorders or out of order um, medical conditions or uh, issues that people are suffering from currently is anxiety so let's just first go a little bit deeper to understand the context that we live in and here's a slide that i put um, about covid and of course, we cannot not talk about COVID. COVID as um, an anxiety syndrome symptom. There are uh, new studies that show it's not just COVID anymore. You know, we suffer from anxiety about COVID, whether it's vaccination, whether it's obsessive thoughts about COVID virus, uh, about people who are close to us and whether we should see them or not, social distancing and isolating when unnecessary, if there's disruption in your sleep, if there's bitterness or hopelessness or feelings about the pandemic that you, you know, debilitating and uh, distracting from your daily life, if there is anxiety over daily activities and work, this is what we call COVID, uh, anxiety syndrome disorder and it's quite a new thing but it's becoming one of the most um, common uh, anxiety these days because of what's happening with the pandemic all over the world so this is the context of course when we look at the youth around the world unfortunately in the recent study it uh, showed that approximately 70% of young people reported feeling anxious or very anxious about COVID-19. Now, a lot of it is hyped by the social media and the youth um, watch and absorb this more than normal news on TV. Most uh, young people have access to gadgets and as Facebook started the emoticons and sharing the the emotions let's say through their platform in 2004 I mean we're talking about less than 20 years but over the last two decades generally social media platforms have really uh, stirred a lot around our emotions and the anxiety is also part of, um, of those emotions, unfortunately. When young people compare themselves to others or they, um, they see all the negative news. So when I work with families and especially when there are young people, teenagers, I always ask how much time 
do they spend on social media and on news and gadgets? And when we look at um, the practical tools, this is one of the things that we measure because it's almost proportionately direct, directional proportion, how much time we spend on social media and how much anxiety we have in life. Uh, even taking into account all the positive things of social media, all the positive things of connecting with friends and family and seeing lovely pictures and uh, looking at dogs and cats and, and funny stories. So um, it's interesting that our brain picks up more on negative rather than positive uh, when there is choice. So we need to be careful what we consume and what we look at, what we hear, and what we touch and who we're surrounding ourselves with, what kind of people are there and what kind of toxic or nourishing um, information we receive throughout the day. When we look at statistics, this is a slide about the pandemic cases. The symptoms of anxiety, unfortunately, disorder increased triple uh, and quadruple for if we compare both anxiety and depressive disorders over the last two years, okay? So it is a very pressing issue for all of us in helping profession and for all of us parents, for all of us, actually everybody is now in need on extra help, extra care uh, when it comes to anxiety. And of course, we're all eco-anxious too. Uh, this is a slide with, with uh, animals. When we look at the global situation with the uh, ecosystems and climate change. Last year, when we moved to Greece, we had the scorching temperature and fires around Greece and fires in Siberia. So, and fires in Canada, all these, um, of course, factors play a role to exacerbate and increase our levels of anxiety. But there's always something we can do about it because the world, it is like that and it's not going to be easier to live in our world. So we need to find ways not just to survive, but also to thrive. And how do we deal with our own internal anxiety and um, how do we deal with external stress? This is what we're going to be talking about today. When we look at, of course, anxiety, we also need to mention who we are. And if there is minority stress, if people come from LGBTQ plus community, if people come from different uh, minority groups and race and uh, background, it is uh, actually uh, more and exacerbated the stress and anxiety that people from minority groups experience generally based on the research we've done across the different fields uh, in psychology. We know that we need to be even more careful when it comes to people of color, people uh, from different places, if they were born somewhere else, if their ancestors are coming from different places and they live in a, um, in a different place, or if they are in relationship with a different um, culture, okay? Cultural nuances matter. So we can never um, overestimate the, the stress level of living uh, in this multifaceted, multicultural environment. So let's be kind and careful with this thing called anxiety. And what I would love to share with you is this enrich method and how we can use very simple, but also evidence-based um, uh, method to help ourselves soothe our busy brain and soothe our anxious body and how we can learn to face the reality with more resources and tools that work. So in the REACH method uh, was created actually based on the systemic work that Virginia Satir, the family therapist, the pioneer in the systemic family field. And uh, she was at the forefront of innovation at her, in her time when it comes to neuroscience, even before the research that we've done in psychology. And also the art of communication 
as well as body work. So this three field, neuroscience, communication and body work. And in the middle, there's an enriched method. Now, how does it work in practical terms? The word enrich, uh, if you think of the first letters, uh, actually each letter stands for a concept that relates to a hormone that in our body. So E stands for explore versus routine. N in the word enrich stands for nourish versus deplete. R stands for respond versus react. I, imagine versus um, uh, willpower. C, communicate instead of assuming how the situation goes. And H stands for hugs and humor, actually, instead of withdrawal. Now, there's a, a whole science behind it, but I'm going to share with you uh, what actually happens when we uh, look at this method and start balancing all these interesting hormones that are associated to this concept. So if you can see the slide, it shows the six different concepts in the word enrich. So the first is explore. When we explore, there is a hormone called dopamine. Dopamine is a wonderful hormone, and we'll talk a lot about it. And there will be a special presentation on this hormone. Um, and uh, it is something that is very important for anxiety, but also in many other forms of mental health issues. In some severe cases, as uh, schizophrenia and bipolar, it also, it also plays a big role. And nourish uh, is fueled by the hormone called serotonin. So we will talk about how to increase serotonin in our system in order to feel more calm and relaxed. Respond is all about lowering cortisol and adrenaline, uh, the hormones of stress. How do we cope with stress better? I'm going to share with you practical tools and tips on that. Imagine is all about flooding our body with endorphins because when we imagine positive uh, situations, we experience almost the same quality um, and the same situations as if they were in real life. So that is a very powerful tool that we have, imagination. And uh, like I, Albert Einstein used to say, imagination is more powerful than will, because when we imagine we can create and structure and actually change physiology of our brain. And with that, the physiology of our body, because our brain is not just in our head. The brain goes in our spinal cord and it goes into our organs. The, we know that we have uh, intuition as part of our uh, mitochondria in the digestive system. It's like having a cat's brain. You know, it's very powerful. All the neurons connected to the vagus nerve that travels from the top of our head to the bottom uh, and connected to all different organs in our body has has consciousness has wisdom so imagining all the lovely uh, processes and lovely uh, safe places and uh, imagining if we were traveling to beautiful locations even if we can't just imagining would help us create that neuroception, uh, neuro connection in our body that helps us heal and helps us feel calmer. Then there's a communication, which is fueled by the hormone called estrogen. When we communicate calmly, when we learn the art of communication, uh, we balance estrogens and when we raise naturally, and I'll share with you some of the tips on how to raise estrogens. And finally, hugs and humor. Hugs are all about raising oxytocin. It's a hormone of trust. It's a hormone of love. It's a hormone of um, sealing that lovely feeling of uh, connectedness uh, with ourselves, with the world. And of course, it starts when we're little babies, when my, our mother or her caregiver used to hold us in um, their hands or uh, 
uh, cuddle when we felt um, uh, anxious. And this is a thing we can do and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's just uh, take this journey through the eyes of the Enrich method. Let's explore first, explore what is stress versus anxiety. Now, stress is all around us, as we know it. So short term, it's a response to a recognized threat. It's a very good thing. It's actually something that really uh, saves us in many cases. And if we were to live in um, a dangerous world, this would be of super good use. And our predecessors, our ancestors were very, very smart and they were very able to use their sympathetic nervous system, their mobilization of their body and their brain, their mind in order to deal with stress. And they probably, they also felt anxious. That's why they survived and they ran away. They fought their tigers and the bears and we managed to be born. They actually gave that uh, opportunity for us to be born because they manage stress and they learn how to be anxious. Now, it's not always pleasant to feel anxious. And of course, anxiety in the lifespan, you know, it lingers and may not have an identifiable trigger. That's the big difference versus stress, that anxiety in the long term, and especially through generations, uh, when we have ancestors who suffered trauma, who suffered uh, injustice, who suffered uh, minority stress. We probably have that in our, uh, in our cells, in our blood, in our DNA, in our memory. And uh, we now know from the studies, uh, it's a lot done on PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, by Rachel Yehuda and um, many institutes around the world, the psychologists who research stress and through generation, intergenerational stress, we know that anxiety travels through generations. And we'll talk a lot more about that in a different presentation. But today is just exploring that angle of stress and anxiety. Now, it's a spectrum. Like everything in life, anxiety has extreme versions. There are types of extreme anxiety like generalized anxiety disorder. It's about feelings of excessive worry about <coughs> events, activities, and situations. It's also... Um, what's called uh, OCD or obsessive compulsive disorders type of extreme anxiety, uh, unwanted recurring thoughts and compulsive repetitive behaviors. There's also PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder that is um, extreme anxiety and distress symptoms due to being exposed to a traumatic event. Panic disorders, intense and recurring panic attacks that occur unexpectedly social anxiety disorder, feelings of extreme anxiety in social situations, and many more like uh, COVID uh, shared earlier, different types of extreme anxiety. So we need to be careful if there is something like that, um, that we notice and there are specific markers for it. For example, the generalized anxiety disorder, which is the most common um, and extreme version of anxiety. It, um, has certain symptoms, okay? Now, of course, we're talking about the psychoeducational piece. So this is not therapy, this is a presentation for everybody. So if you notice that you suffer from this side, um, from the symptoms, you can, you can go and speak to your medical health provider and find out more. But generally, if you have restlessness, and fatigue, excessive anxiety and worry, increased muscle aches or soreness, impaired concentration, irritability, and difficulty sleeping for more days uh, on the course of more than six months. This is something to, to uh, really look into and see or, and take it with your medical care provider or therapist. Now, um, when we look at anxiety from the iceberg perspective, this is, uh, you know, anxiety is a tip of the iceberg and it's a behavior, it's a feeling, huh? but um, actually there's a lot more going on below the surface level. When we dig deeper, we can find out that there's so many feelings uh, that um, 
cause or sort of lie, lie behind uh, that anxiety. It may be feelings of helplessness or hurt, insecure or embarrassment, ashamed or disgusted or feeling overwhelmed, depressed or stuck or jealous, disrespected or offended, lonely, feeling grief or sadness, feeling uncomfortable or rejected, frustrated, all that, tired, right? Now, that's just anxiety behavior on the surface. But when we um, revise that anxiety iceberg model, we see that even above the surface, you know, it could be a behavior like, uh, uh, you know, avoidance, right? Or um, negativity, you know, a person who's constantly negative or chandeliering. Chandeliering is a very interesting one. It's like going from zero to hundred. It's like sort of... Um, uh, extreme version of uh, of uh, irritability or anger, right? Like very, very strong, out of the blue suddenly. Or people start to over planning more and becoming you know, OCD about certain things. So compulsive, sort of compulsive disorder comes to surface or lack of focus. Now, all this uh, are signs, right? So we are just exploring different pieces, potential causes. For example, for social anxiety disorder, that is a uh, second most uh, common after uh, the uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Now, if we have limited socialization, which is now the reality with COVID, right? If there's a history of, of being bullied or um, when we have over overprotective parents, when there are memories of public humiliation, and there's also genetics that plays a role. These are uh, potential causes for, you know, something that's very serious that can be um, and needs to be treated with, with care and kindness. If you have children, or if you work with people who have children, children with anxiety may not even um, be able to say, most children cannot even express uh, that they're feeling anxious, right? Because their prefrontal cortex, that part of their brain that is sort of behind your, um, uh, your forehead, it's not yet developed up until they become 25 years old. This part is being developed consistently and uh, it requires emotional regulation. Now, children, if you see the slide, it has all sorts of um, uh, symptoms that may be the signals for anxiety. For example, they may appear more clingy than normal. They may be restless and fidgety. They may start complaining about their stomach aches or display changes in eating and sleeping habits. They may express negative thoughts or worries. They get upset or angry more quickly. They have bouts of unexplained crying or tantrums, and they may struggle to concentrate. Now, these could be signs of anxiety. Eight ways that a child's anxiety shows up as something else. I, when I browsed internet and I saw this and I thought, oh, let me show you this. First is anger. No? The perception of danger, stress, or opposition is enough to trigger the fight or flight response, leaving your child angry and without a way to communicate why. Difficulty sleeping is the second one. In children, having difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep is one of the hallmark characteristics of anxiety. Three, defiance, very interesting one. Unable to communicate what is really going on, it is easy to interpret the child's defiance as a lack of discipline instead of an attempt to control a situation where they feel anxious and helpless. Four, Chandeliering. Chandeliering is when a seemingly calm person suddenly flies off the handle for no reason. They have pushed hurt and anxiety so deep for so long that seemingly innocent common or event suddenly sends them straight through the chandelier. Five, lack of focus. Children with anxiety are often so caught up in their own thoughts that they do not pay attention to what is going on around them. Six, avoidance. Children who are trying to avoid a particular person, place or task often end up experiencing more of whatever it is they are avoiding. Number seven, negativity. 
People with anxiety tend to experience negative thoughts at a much greater intensity than positive ones. And number eight, overplanning. Overplanning and defiance go hand in hand in their root cause, where anxiety can cause some children to try to take back control through defiant behavior. It can cause others to overplan for situations where planning is minimal or unnecessary. I find it so helpful when I looked at one of our children who just changed schools and I couldn't understand why he was so defined, why he lacked focus and he once forgot to close our entrance door when we went um, to a beach for eight hours we were missing. I come back home and the door is wide open and I thought, wow, what is happening? And of course, I thought maybe, you know, he's trying to trigger me. He's trying to play this power game with me. Maybe he's tr trying to find a place now that the younger you know, child was born. And actually, he was just going through a lot of stress, changing school, changing country. And yes, finding a new place when uh, another child was born. So children do not show and tell uh, the anxiety per se. They do not tell you that it's anxiety, but they show other symptoms that um, you can recognize. An interesting slide that I thought to share with you is to ask yourself and reflect what kind of anxiety person am I? Because we all experience anxiety, let's face it. But let's dig into what kind of person are you? There's anxiety starter, right? A person who just brings us to the party, okay? Or starts the anxiety. There's anxiety deflector, a person who just deflects. Anxiety dampener, anxiety booster, or anxiety absorber. Now, as you contemplate about this and try to use different hats to uh, reflect who are you think about it and um yeah just pose um that question and start reflecting what am i doing to help my children or help my clients help myself and help my family how do i help with anxiety what can i do even the little steps that count one of the things that helps me and I love is that um, we have this anxiety thermometer, okay? Um, I communicate with uh, both personally and professionally, especially personally with our children and with my husband. I say where on an anxiety thermometer we are. I am, first of all. When everything is good, I'm in a green zone. When I get into a stressful situation, but I may appear very calm, but I'm boiling on the inside and I'm in the yellow zone. I say yellow zone. So everybody knows that if they cross that line with me, I get into the red zone. And that's when the, uh, the, the, the big uh, you know, dragon mama the, comes out. But in order for, uh, for us to deal, and I help myself, as well, uh, we are all human and we're all, even in helping profession, we all deal with anxiety the same way. We use the tools, right? So this is one of the tools is to communicate anxiety thermometer. And when I'm in a red zone, my family members know that the only thing that they need to give me is space, okay? It's like a timeout. So I need to leave. They need to go. We don't speak. We don't talk. Timeout means no talking. I need to come down. And the only thing they can do is hug, okay? Because I'm kinesthetic, I ask them, if I'm in the red zone, please hug me. Because probably I'm not regulating myself very well at that time already. So I am sort of, you know, my brain is uh, flip open and I'm sort of flying down and I, I need that hug and I need that space to soothe myself. So I need, I need quiet zone to go from red to yellow and hopefully to green. Tips for overcoming anxiety that are very much available everywhere. If you Google anxiety, I am not particularly pro medication, but also, also not against it if that's necessary. If there's an extreme version, as we discussed, and that's something that uh, you've agreed and discussed with your medical uh, doctor. 
But what I like about this slide is it shows how we can accept without analyzing our intrusive thoughts because we are so prone to thinking negatively and hyper sort of hyping ourselves into anxiety. We're, uh, you know, all the time worrying, right? Questioning, uh, doubting. Is it right? Am I doing right? So how can we just accept? I love this notion of radical acceptance. It's something that uh, when I work with uh, very severe cases of bipolar or suicidal clients, people with um, extreme version of anxiety, is how do we accept um, whatever is happening, even our suicidal thoughts, even if our, when our low self-esteem uh, on a scale from zero to 10, you know, how am I doing, you know? Uh, and if I move just, you know, if I was seven and I moved to six, or if I was nine and I moved to eight, that's great. But even if I'm super anxious, even when I'm very stressed and I've done something bad, I still forgive myself, I accept myself. And this is one of the resources and one of the tools that works wonders, okay? Another tip is to expose yourself to triggers mildly, okay? Well, you're not of course, in an extreme version of anxiety, but when you're in an emotionally regulated state, uh, it's a muscle, okay? Anxiety regulation is a muscle that we can develop. And over time, when we expose, and there is a whole therapy that's called prolonged exposure, PE, prolonged exposure therapy, that helps us navigate trauma, extreme stress, anxiety, depression, etc. So it's a really interesting uh, way to, uh, to expose something that we feel anxious about. I mean, people feel anxious about so many trifle things, even like making a phone call or um, uh, having a birthday party, right? Um, you know, my partner, for example, he, he doesn't like birthdays. And uh, every time he was born in, in the summer and maybe in his childhood, I don't know why he doesn't like his birthdays and he never celebrates even his anniversary. So when we started looking into this and I said, okay, let's just create a little party and expose yourself to triggers. And slowly, 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 we, we started celebrating his birthday and he's now doing better, but okay, let's not over um, demand. Okay, no, no expectations, just accept whatever it is. And that is a great step towards overcoming anxiety how to cope with social anxiety. I like this slide because it shows that we can, um, by avoiding certain things like caffeine or um, practicing deep breathing, we can also regulate something that is quite serious. And most people hate being in front of other people because it is, um, well, in a way it used to be a danger, you know? Uh, being in front of people causes all sorts of triggers. So how do we embrace and we take deep breaths and we avoid things that trigger us? If we take a lot of sugar, let's cut it down. We know that avoiding alcohol also can help us manage anxiety. Uh, quitting smoking or starting exercise. And we'll talk a little bit more about exercise in, in a bit. Now, of course, that is all good, but how do we do with all these worries, the pandemic, the struggles, the taxes, the financial uh, now implications of crisis and wars and you know all this going on? And we need help. It is this little child in the inside screaming, "Help! Help!" That's something that uh, you know. I love this slide. It really depicts that we all need a bit of help. And um, what I would love is for us to, you know, take a deep breath, now connect to our body, find that place inside us as you listen to my voice. And, you know, it's, uh, there is always a place where we feel good. You know, there's always a place we can find either in our imagination or uh, in our past where we felt safe. There are other things that, you know, small things that can help with anxiety. 
that are very practical, you know, you can phone a friend or have the deep breathing practice or hold on to someone, you know, when we hold on, there's an art of haptics, you know, our, our fingers have this uh, little, uh, uh, little cells that send signals to our brain when we hold on especially to a hand ah it's soothing you know when we hold our hands up and open we send signals to our brain it's uh, safe when we lower our shoulders down when we take a deep breath it's safe cues for safety when we go for a walk when we have that warm shower or maybe a bath with oil just looking up into the sky and smile it's a cue for safety when we engage all senses imagine the magical garden or we have this uh, little distractions you know even painting nails or having a bit of self-care walking a dog petting a pet even a little bit of tv it's okay a distraction Okay, calming music, doing something with your hands or writing it out, journaling, drinking cold water, sipping through your favorite drink that is soothing, healthy, hopefully not soda, but even soda, accept it, just to relax. But, you know, having also maybe tomorrow uh, a healthier choice, cuddling away blanket. You know, just cuddling it, uh, cuddling with a pillow, cuddling yourself, doodling. You know, when you just express yourself on a piece of paper, uh, I find very liberating. And children do that. We don't do that enough. You know, people who use art and craft uh, is a fantastic way to remove stress and release that anxiety from the inside. For people who love reading, there are many, many books. I can recommend these six uh, by David Burns, the doctor who wrote When Panic Attacks, the new drug-free anxiety therapy that can change your life. A book called Dare, the new way to end anxiety and stop panic attacks by Barry McDonough. Rewire your anxious brain, how to use the neuroscience to of fear to end anxiety, panic, and worry by Catherine Pittman and Elizabeth Carroll. Uh, Anxiety Practical About Panic uh, by Joshua Fletcher, a practical guide to understanding and overcoming anxiety disorder. A fifth one is called Untangler Your Anxiety, a guide to overcoming anxiety disorder by two people who have been through it by Joshua Fletcher and Dean Stott. And finally, uh, Greater Than Panic by Dean Stott. Okay, uh, a lot of resources here. Now, let's go to the enriched method and uh, look at it through the lenses of these hormones. So explore. We explored a lot and uh, why it is so important um, to, uh, to explore because when we explore this whole thing of dopamine, right? The, so the studies have shown that lower than usual amounts of dopamine in the brain are often present alongside symptoms of ADHD, okay? Uh, anxiety, and one study linked anxiety to insufficient dopamine in the amygdala, but more, anxiety, more studies come to show that when we raise dopamine, uh, we actually can soothe our brain and uh, help it help it uh, remove the anxiety level. Now, when we nourish, we'll raise our uh, serotonin level. And serotonin level can be raised naturally by exercise. Regular exercise can have mood boosting effects. A healthy diet, foods that can increase serotonin uh, level include eggs, surprisingly, cheese, who, have, who could believe, right? Turkey, nuts, salmon, tofu, and pineapple. Very interesting. And meditation. The art of meditation can help release stress and promote a positive outlook on life, which can greatly boost serotonin levels. 
Now I have a, a two videos here. I don't know if we have time to watch both of them, but um, maybe we can share that uh, with you separately as part of this presentation. I love love the video about brain changing benefits of exercise by Dr. Wendy Suzuki. It's part of the TED Talks and it's one of the videos that really changed my attitude to exercise. I hate exercise, to be honest. I, I okay, I used to run. I did track and field. Uh, I was part of the Olympic uh, reserve team uh, when I was little, but since then I stopped exercising. But when I watched this video, I started exercise again. And I would love to share this with you. I don't know if we if it would work, but let's see. Yeah, oh. I've done it about you. This is the one. How do we switch this? Okay, let's see. This is not the video, but maybe it will start soon. Why oh, no. We... <laughs> okay, no, that's not. Okay, so let's just uh, hope that oh, we can share that. But if you Google Wendy Suzuki TED Talk, you will see this video. And it's it's like almost 20 million views. And it's really, really worth watching. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Respond. Respond is about how do we reduce cortisol level naturally. The cortisol level and um, cortisol is a hormone of stress. When we eat a whole food plant-based diet, uh, it's one of the ways to reduce cortisol levels naturally. When um, we take deep breaths and nourish our body, and our uh, lungs, when we reduce caffeine intake, when we get adequate sleep, when we exercise regularly, when we write in a journal, and when we indulge in hobbies, when we learn how to juice a, uh, something that we love doing, when we do what we love, okay? When we experience that sparkle of joy, uh, when we uh, reduce cortisol level. Of course, there are many levels. So in the following presentations, when I, uh, next uh, few weeks, we will, uh, you will learn how to reduce uh, cortisol level at looking uh, not just at this simple ways, but also at the slightly deeper levels, how to work with your family of origin, how to work through transgenerational, intergenerational trauma. But for now, I would like to share this eight uh, very simple ways for you to reduce your cortisol level naturally. Now, when we imagine, as we discussed, we also uh, boost the endorphins. This is a lovely beach in Greece. Uh, and um, uh, when we went there, of course, it's lovely. But you know, for the last two three years, we we can't we couldn't travel. So by imagining being there, we can also um, boost our endorphins. And again, exercise comes to place. Exercise is well known for its most boosting effect, a role in decreasing symptoms of depression, anxiety, and boosting our endorphins. Laughing, listening to music, getting acupuncture, um, eating dark chocolate, having sex, even with yourself, dancing, meditating are all proven ways to boost our endorphins. Now, communication in the art of boosting estrogens. We can also um, boost estrogens by eating phytoestrogen rich food. Now, plant based diet and uh, have plants generally have a similar structure to estradiol, uh, which is the strongest form of the estrogen hormone. So, eating plants is great to boost our estrogen and that helps our communication. How cool is that? I mean, uh, when I uh, eat uh, healthy, I feel less triggered and less angry. When we have a B vitamin, vitamin D, or um, uh, Vitex Agnus Castus, I mean, Google what it is, Boron, Black Kosh, or even Primrose Oil, all these natural things, I mean, Please take this only with your medical uh, doctor. This is just uh, education for something to be curious about, something to look into 
especially if uh, you are you know, reducing your medication or you're trying to be without medication. Because long-term, we know uh, there are better ways to sustain uh, rather than you know, anti-anxiety pills or chemical ways to reduce anxiety. But again, take it with your um, medical health provider. Now, hugs are a natural way to boost oxytocin. Oxytocin is a trust hormone, as I mentioned. And if we don't have people to hug, we can always hug a pet. We can hug a tree. We can hug ourselves. You can just feel the power of hug. As Virginia used to say, Satir, uh, we need four hugs a day to survive, eight hugs a day to live a good life, and 12 hugs a day to thrive. So how many hugs a day do you have? So here is the enriched method. We just kind of brushed through it. Uh, uh, they explore, explore what it is to be anxious, but also explore different ways. Open your arms, rotate your feet slowly, look into the sky and smile, or have a half smile. Even if you cannot smile, just half smile. It also sends a signal to your brain to relax. There's a magic behind the smile. People who smile often, they have that sort of radiance, uh, easy looking, um, uh, sort of relaxed vibe. Huh? Now it's not, uh, yeah, it, it's actually, uh, scientifically proven that smiling helps us regulate our stress and anxiety. Yeah? Nourishing, exercise and nourishing food, responding to stress. How do we prepare and lower our cortisol and help our children lower their cortisol? Because it's our role as parents to help them navigate and regulate their emotions. Up until the 25, they rely on us to regulate uh, their emotional world. Imagining, you know, positive, uh, meditating and writing journals, imagining scenarios where you feeling good, where you're healthy, where you're just making that step towards a better habit, exercising and doing what you love, communicating, communicating positively as well, the art of communication. Um, there's a wonderful tool on how to communicate to reduce anxiety, also created by Virginia Satir. It's called temperature reading. Uh, always, always first start with appreciation. Uh, if you want to say something negative, always start with say something positive first. I know it's not easy. I know it's hard, but it's a muscle. You can train it and you can start practicing now. When you finish this workshop, you can go and say something nice to your partner, to your family member, to yourself in the mirror, to your children, just communicating the positive first, okay? Then you share uh, something maybe that puzzles you or maybe you worry, and then you communicate a hope and wish that's also positive. So it's like a sandwich, you know, a bun in the middle, the worry or negative bit, but always with a little bit of cushion, a little bit of buffer. So you start with positive and end with positive. And finally, hugs, hugs and humor to boost that oxytocin, okay? So here it is, a very simple enrich method that you can implement now in your everyday life. And we will re uh, refresh and I will share more about uh, this helpful practical tools when we talk about depression because depression and anxiety go hand in hand, but there are slightly different ways to do it and different um, practices uh, to boost and rebalance this whole cocktail of hormones in our body. It's a big job. So take it slow, be kind to yourself, take it easy one step at a time. Okay, well, I want to thank you for uh, listening, for being up until now with us. If you want more information, here's my website, dariahaitoglu.com, D-A-R-Y-A-H-A-I-T-O-G-L-O-U.com. I know it's complicated. Haitoglu is a, actually a Greek name of my uh, husband, who's Greek, and they come from Turkey. Okay, so it's a Greek Turkish, and Daria is my first name. 
I have an Instagram account called the.family.psychologist. You can find me there uh, on uh, Facebook uh, or on uh, enrich.global. It's a website where uh, we host different retreats and you have information there for different workshops. And also Virginia Satir website, virginiasatir.co.uk. It's a UK website where we share tools, we host workshops on a monthly basis. We also have wonderful, wonderful free resources. And of course, um, I thank you for uh, just giving yourself time to uh, listen to my voice and reduce hopefully some of the anxiety uh, that you experience throughout your uh, life in the last hour. Hopefully your anxiety level went down because now you're equipped with simple tools that you can implement and take it home. Okay, Vicky, I think that's it.